Hey everybody, welcome back. I am the Gerbil, and this is the Grand Arena Round 1 for July 7th, 2020. Here's my opponent, Forehead VCR. Uh, he's got a GP advantage and significant 42 more Zetas, but only 2 Omicrons to my 5. He does have 5 GLs though, and I have 2, but I totally outclass him in mods. Look at that, 15 plus speed mods. I have more than double. Uh, here's all of the matches, timestamps in the description below. You can jump ahead if you want to see any of these. Um, not a lot of surprises here. Uh, we got Gas against Maul, uh, three person Jedi Master Luke against Qui Gon Jinn. Um, but not a lot of surprises. Ewoks, of course, dominate once again versus Night Sisters. And we have a full clear. 1812 banners, good year, I remember it well. Um, lost a friend that year though, 1812. Yeah, small conflict in North America, might have heard about it. Did you know, hist history here, uh, fun fact, that the White House, the United States you know, presidential building, the White House, was not always white. In fact, I believe it was green before it was white. And I do believe in the War of 1812, the British occupied Washington DC and burned it to the ground, burned the White House, that is, and then after it was rebuilt, uh, it was painted white. Was the White House always grew, uh, white? I don't want to be that teacher teaching wrong stuff, so. The White House is made of a gray colored sandstone from a quarry in Virginia. Okay, interesting. The sandstone walls weren't painted white until the house was reconstructed after British fires, according to ThoughtCo.com. British fires. I like how they put that, after British fires. Not after it was burned to the ground during a war, but after British fires. Well done, Britain. You have fires named after you. Okay, come on, see. Do your little dzz, dzz, so we can move on. Dzz. I mean, if you can go dzz and make a whole sky of a thousand starships lose power, you should handle one person in front of you. I always thought it was really dumb how, no matter how powerful his dzz is, all you have to do to beat it is hold a lightsaber in front of you. And how he was never smart enough to go, hey, this hurts, dzz, maybe I should stop going dzz and try something else. I, I, I mean, he goes dzz versus Mace and and keeps dzz zapping, and he did it versus Ray, and it didn't work. I wonder how many other Jedi that didn't work against, and he's just like, I'm gonna do this until it works, like literally the definition of insanity. Just keep trying and getting the same outcomes, expecting for something different. Oh well, oh well, it is what it is, right? Maul. So I guess either Maul is just the in thing, or I'm reaching a Kyber level where where Maul is much more of a thing. Because like I'm seeing Maul every GAC now in defense. Like every GAC on defense. Oh snap! I've got to get him past like gear nine. <laughs> it's really weird having like two clones at relic three i think and the other two are like nine nine ten it just doesn't work out well because inevitably the weaker ones always get popped no matter what and then you know your relic fives just falls over sacks himself save yourself run forest run so July 9th. No, it's July 9th when I'm recording this here in Shanghai. I got behind, got distracted with uh, the Raven's Claw, which I'm going to talk more about later, but I posted a video yesterday um, talking about Razor Claw synergies, and I think I boo booed. I think there's a potential big mistake in there. I watched Arnold's Raven's Claw unlocking this morning. And it was really, really funny. I, I really loved it. I, I think he sings really good, actually. I, I really 
uh, was laughing and chuckling so hard when he was singing during the Whale or Fail segment. But when he went to playtest Raven's Claw, I think he was making a lot of mistakes. Um, he kept trying to apply the daze um, rather than attacking, which when you have foresight, the basic double taps and calls an assist. And the assist is where the rebels succeed with home one because when they assist or attack out of turn, that's when they gain bonus protection and do 100% more critical damage from home one's leadership the special maneuver on the raven's claw is nice but i think it needs to be avoided for the most part it should also be removing a hundred percent turn meter if i remember it correctly and honestly when i saw those videos i don't think i ever saw it take away turn meter so i could be wrong i didn't super like carefully pay attention to it but it could be bugged let's go check it out swgoh.gg and let's go find the brand new Ravenclaw. Wait, no, Raven's Claw. This is not Harry Potter as much as I might want it to be. Uh, yeah, you can see my castle behind me slowly expanding that thing. It's getting bigger and bigger all the time. All right, Raven's Claw. So yeah, that the Out of the Sun deal physical damage to all enemies and remove 50% turn meter. Okay, so it removes half turn meter. That might be why I didn't see it happening. But it says if Home 1 is the capital ship, which it was, instead remove 100% turn meter and days and target lock. So like against Negotiator, Arnold was trying to hit that days uh, and target lock on Hound's Tooth when it when in reality he should have been hitting anakin with it because that prevents anakin from taking a turn and then you're thinking but hound's tooth is going to go under taunt and my response is so what anytime a rebel attacks out of turn basic attack um shared attacks aoe from home one etc they gain foresight and when they have foresight ravenclaw says they can ignore taunt so in most of the playtesting, Arnold was really focusing on the tank, and I think that that's the tactical mistake. I think you just have to ignore the tanks, just go around the tanks. And then there's another interesting thing here. So that basic says, double tap, um, and then if you're attacking a target lock enemy, which again, use that special on Anakin, not Houndstooth, right? Um, so you attack Anakin, double, you can double tap, call an ally to assist so here's the thing the ally is a non scoundrel ally which means nobody's think really considering the falcon or um outrider with it and i think that's the mistake i think actually i did boo boo in yesterday's synergy video maybe not because that was a synergy video i want to do a strategy video next because i think maybe the starting lineup actually is hounds uh sorry um falcon ravenclaw and biggs because what happens is, when he double taps, he's going to call Biggs to assist. Biggs' basic applies taunt. And so that taunt triggers foresight on Raven's Claw. So it gets it back after attacking somebody who's not taunting. Um, and then it's a triple shot. And then when Biggs and Raven Claw attack, Hans Millennium Falcon has a 50% chance to assist. And I'm wondering also if that triggers each time Raven Claw shoots. If it does, because then Raven's Claw shoots, Hans Million Falcon check, Raven's Claw shoots again, Falcon check, Biggs assists, Falcon check. Now I know the Falcon only shoots once per turn in this situation, but there's three attempts there. So even though the Raven's Claw doesn't synergize with the Falcon, the Falcon loves the Raven's Claw. So the Raven's Claw goes pew pew, Biggs goes pew, target lock, attack out of turn, gain some um, bonus protection, where a bigs taunts gains recovers his own protection hans millennium falcon says three shots or two at a minimum high probability that it shoots out of turn dispels applies another target lock on basic if it lands a crit gives bigs even more protection recovery and of course taunt so i don't recall if he ever tried that but i think that that's maybe the way to go at least until we get profundity so I'm really, 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 really eager to play test it. Now the Falcon is not super fast though, right? Um, the the thing is, Biston is always in the starting lineup because he's fast. He goes first, 
triggers a taunt, which gets everything started, hope for an assist from the Falcon. But what if instead of the Falcon, you run the Outrider? Because the Outrider is fast. The Outrider can replace Biston in there. Let me find Outrider. Outrider, Outrider, Outrider and me. That was Kid Sister, an advertisement from the 80s. Kid Sister. Uh, so the Outrider... Yeah, see, the Outrider speed, max speed, is 209, which is really, really fast. So it can go first for sure. Um, and then... It can also inflict that target lock to get the train going, right? So what you do is you do the concealed concussion missiles, um, which gives you potentially five crit hits, each one delivering 5% turn meter to the whole team. Um, it inflicts target lock, which gets Biggs taunting, gets the foresight onto the Raven's Claw. So then if you land that, both Biggs and Raven's Claw are going to go next. I mean, guaranteed, they're going to go next. So then you shoot the person who's target locked. And when that happens, it's going to double tap, call an assist. The assist is going to call either Biggs or Outrider. Outrider's basic attacks three times and inflicts crit damage down. And if you're attacking the target locked enemy, the, the concussion missile's cooldown goes down. Which means you're going to get to do that more and more and more. I like the Falcon better, even though it's slower. So I think if you're going up against a slower fleet, the Falcon, Raven's Claw, and Biggs might be the best starting lineup. Not sure. I, I really, really am eager to try this. And if you're going up against a fast fleet, maybe Outrider. The, the real shortcoming right now in Raven's Claw is that you're losing that passive cleanse that the Falcon had. So you're not, you're not like, you know, every time the ship gets three debuffs, Falcon would just say, heal, right? Not heal, but cleanse. We don't have that. So we'll have to see how that goes. I'm not even paying attention to my GAC here. I don't even know what's going on. Oh, Revan. Yeah, this was a free win. Honestly, I had... What, 246 15 plus speeds mods and my opponent had like 100? That's, that's one reason this was so easy. If you want to be competitive, if you want to get into the top kybers, um, any kyber, actually, if you just want to get into kyber and you want to shoot for like kyber 1, 2, 3, you really, really, really should optimize your mods. I mean, I hate spending time working on mods, but it's something you should be doing every week. Here we go, let's destroy Phasma. I am wholly convinced now, after two GACs basically, five GAC matches with my Relic uh, Grand Inquisitor, a lot of play in Grand Arena, or just Arena, and then a territory battle last week and another one tomorrow, or I'll, I'll keep testing. But I am wholly convinced now that the Inquisitors are way better than the public reception has been. Because the public reception, as I've said before, only compared them to General Kenobi and Jedi Master Luke. Or not General, Jedi Master Kenobi and Jedi Master Luke. And it's like, duh. I mean, like, imagine you're watching the NFL draft or the NBA draft or something, right? And you're, you know, the Chicago Bulls picks up a new player who was, um, I don't know, the number one college ball player in the country. If every newspaper was to say, yeah, well, he can't beat Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant, so he sucks. Then the public perception of that player would be that they suck. I think we got to stop, just stop taking what CG says so, like, as truth, right? Just start recognizing that they're going to put some marketing spin into this stuff. They want us to spend some money. So just wait till the characters come out to a degree, right? And, and let the community play them, test them, experience them before we hold them up to such a high standard. No character in the game, except for another GL, I think could have lived up to the Grand Inquisitor's expectations. And as a result, he's doomed. Anyway, um, 
I'm, I'm going to put together a in Inquisitor compilation video. Um, so we just saw him destroy Phasma. That's a duh. No brainer there. Uh, today I took them up against Resistance. Got 65 banners. Yesterday I beat two Jedi Master Lukes in Arena, which is really, really hard. Uh, really hard. It seems that I would say three out of four matches, Revan just directly marks Grand Inquisitor. And that's so frustrating because when, when he marks Grand Inquisitor and you lose him, it's game over. So it's like one play, boom, game over. If he doesn't mark the Grand Inquisitor, you got a chance. It also depends on who the assisting players are, of course. So, like, if it's Jedi Master Luke with Jedi Knight Luke with um, Revan and Gas, uh, that's hard. And again, it's like, oh, come on. You're talking about Gas, legendary, right? Jedi Knight Luke, legendary character. Um, I don't remember if Revan... I think Revan was a Journey Guide legendary character. I don't remember. But... Uh, but Hermit Yoda in there, right? Um, so, yeah, versus four marquees and one journey guide. It's like, they should win. Not the Inquisitors. They should, but the Jedi should win. Also, really, really been struggling um, with the with Inquisitors versus Jedi Knight Luke lead. And I guess that makes sense, because he drops their speed down. One of their advantages is their incredible speed for fun i've modded my in grand inquisitor up to like 360 speed um i think it's like 360 maybe it's 350 i don't remember it's really high and it's kind of fun but you know jedi knight luke just says zip drop it down to my speed buddy slow down rebels go rebels rebel rebel bo pebbles banana fan of faux pebbles so I don't know if you all know the YouTube channel Celiac Sarah. Uh, just discovered her yesterday. Um, I like her channel. She did a really good video outlining what she thinks are maybe some of the top 10 or the best conquest squads. And as she was going down the list, I was like, yep, agree, 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 agree. It's actually, it's like the same video that I have been contemplating making for a couple months and just never have because I just haven't. So I was really glad to see that she did that because it's not like a late game, end game, right? I really, really like so many of the other content creators out there, but a lot of them have like, you know, all Galactic Legends at Relic 9 and everything. And, and I think it's very easy sometimes for people to just forget that the vast majority of the players are still early to mid game. And I, I kind of, I do that too, obviously. I mean, I got 7 million GP now. But I still try to do a lot of fun stuff with things like Ewoks, right? Just showing some potential, or now Inquisitors, or Akbar, Leia, right? These are these are earlier characters. Inquisitors, you're probably like, no, they're not. Well, yeah, if you're an early game player, you probably got all of them marquee. And um, even mid-game, you could unlock them all. Should you gear them all up? Probably not. There are better paths to go. Uh, especially right now, I think Starkiller is probably the route for most people to pursue because Kyle, uh, Mara, Talon, and Dash are all easily accessible to farm. And two of them now have ships, and I think that they will be important for the new meta. And I also think that all four of them are going to get ships. I'm pr I feel certain Talon's going to get a ship and Mara's going to get a ship. I mean, Mara's had a couple ships in lore. She's going to get a ship. Certain of it. And then Talon just makes sense to get a ship because sometime down the road we will get a capital Sith ship. And she's had one before. And if it's not her, it may be Dark Nihilus. But we need more ships, period. It makes sense that they would give her a Sith ship. Oh, look! We win! Awesome! Anyway, thanks for watching. I will see you all later. Take care. Bye-bye.